brother. brother! And welcome everyone to our spoiler review of The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes, a movie I have been looking forward to so much. We saw it last night. Are you, uh, are you, were you, what were, what were your initial thoughts? Oh my gosh, yeah, I feel like you're overwhelmed. You're like, I you're do, like dude, bubbling out. Like, we haven't gotten to do a review in so long. I know, I know, it's very <laughs> exciting, it's very exciting. Um, and we did spend a lot of time this summer um, yeah. going through and writing some of our favorite fan theories, which I'm really excited to see, like, whether or not people stumble into. I'm sure we'll discuss some of them during today's review. Yep. Um, but yeah, no, I think honestly, Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes was like a really, uh, fascinating addition to like the otherwise Hunger Games saga. I yep. think it sort of like gives us a lot of understanding about President Snow as a character, sort of like where he came from, the implications of like what it was like for Katniss to emerge on scene in the first place. Yep. Like the, the connective tissue across like what is a, a 65 year, 64 year span of time yeah. is un, unreal. It but is crazy. I, I personally, like when I read the book, uh, I was like, this meshes together really nicely. The thing that I'm most curious to talk to you about today is that the book itself, The Ballad of Songbirds and Sake, yep. is very long compared to the other Hunger Games yes, it is. Uh, books you know, themselves. <clears throat> Mockingjay was broken to two different films. We had all of Ballad inside of one mega film here, so. Curious to see what your thoughts were on how they packed all of it in with today's review. Hey, brother! Well, dude, I have to tell you that I think they did an amazing job it's packing it all in. I think, I mean, I, I don't know about you, but I thought it was one of like the best like page to screen adaptations, like beat for beat, like, that did just have ever seen. It, it was, yeah. So, in, and this is this is what was like probably like the most prominent thing in my mind upon exiting the theater, which was that like, I because I agree with you. I think that like it was like, like whenever you adapt uh, this many pages to movie format, there right. is always things that are going to like have, have to, to be like, dri you know, dripping down right. and, and not making it into like what you ultimately see on right. screen. And, and there was some of that present for sure. There was, and I think yeah. some of it, you know, like, like I think there were some things that were important that I would have loved to have seen, but but at the same rate, I'm not complaining because I feel like what they did, I think was sort of a masterclass in, in basically being able to provide a film that successfully conveys the overall message and narrative of the story without yeah. leaving gaping holes along the way. Right. You and didn't feel like, well, they left this out, and because they left that out, then you didn't understand this. Yes. And and yeah. so like the the really interesting and so to, to sort of like present some of my my overall feelings about the film uh kind of early on, but like what what was sort of amazing to me was like I, I thoroughly enjoyed the movie and I actually think it's a fantastic adaptation. But like, I think the, the number one thing that was resonating in my mind was how much I appreciate a book yeah. um, upon leaving because this story in particular is highly, highly complicated in order, you know, from, from a storyteller's perspective, because you are knowingly telling the story of someone who is dark and dangerous, yeah. but also incredibly charming, very likable. Oh, I know. Like, like there are times when you're watching, you just sort of like, you're like sort of rooting for him and you like feel bad for him and you're like starting to emotionally connect with Snow. And then like, I thought they did do a good job of any time they let one of those moments linger, they're like, no, we need to quickly remind you this is the villain. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and that's, that's that's the thing too, is that like, you know, when when people first saw Thanos, like one of the big things was like, oh, how relatable is this villain as a character? And like, I think that made him really, you know, uh, like resonate with the audience. Uh, Cause people were like, oh, it's it's a different kind of villain that we're seeing. And I, and I think that this is in a similar category where it's like, you're you're watching it and you're just like you said, I mean, you're you're kind of rooting for this guy, but then you're like, no, I can't be rooting for no, this guy, but this guy. And um, it's like, but, and for the most part, like until the end, he is sort of walking that line. There's like the two objects he used to help like win the games with and like um well, well he's given the compass at the beginning after his dad dies and then he has the compact from his mom and those are supposed to be like the the two sides of his personality basically like sometimes he's acting more like his mom and sometimes he's acting more like his dad until like in in the book at the very end he's like decided to go out with lucy gray and chooses love and it's like oh he's doing the thing and he gives her the compact and then the compact gets destroyed in the rain and he literally uses his compass to navigate himself back to the life you eventually know and it's like okay you definitely chose dad yes and yeah it's like that i mean that was still um 
that was still present. Well, sure. and the thing that, that, that I found to be kind of interesting about the Hunger Games in general, because you're exactly right. Like yeah. inside of the book, I feel like the, the compass and the compact are two things that are vitally important. And we get a lot yeah. more backstory on Coriolanus's mother in the book itself, yeah. where she was like a kind and caring and loving person who like clearly like had this like deep connection with her, you know, with her son yeah. um, and is overall like a positive. And then the father on the other hand was like the one who like built all of the wealth and was very like prominent and sort of had all of like these good things, uh, well not good things, but like, you know, it, it like elevated them to uh, the, the kind of like status that the Snow family like has otherwise like known right. for most of their life. And inside of the Hunger Games, it feels like they frequently do this with each of the, the main character's parents is that you usually have one, one parent that the character draws strength from and the other parent that is basically like represents like their weakness. Yeah. So like Katniss has this like, where when she is pulled into the games, she can either be resourceful like her father was or just like crumple like, you know, her mother did right. in, in the wake of the loss of her father, which in its own self is, you know, an understandable reaction to those circumstances. But then like PETA is the same way. Like, you know, he has a father who's like incredibly like caring and loving and warm and thoughtful. And then like the mother who's kind of like, like dark and mean. Yelling at him and, all the time. And, right. Yeah. And, and all throughout, you know, like PETA could look at Katniss and he could look at the way that like, that, like he, their their relationship has been forged and he could take like the mother's perspective and be like you used me like you made me believe you loved me and like you right. didn't like and he could turn sour and Peter doesn't he holds true to like his positivity so like you you see that and again what it's it's represented with Coriolanus where he's got you know the mother who's very kind the father who's very not kind um and one of the things that I feel like was was delivered well in the book that we didn't get to see as much of but I think it's worth mentioning is then um how those ideals are then represented with Tigris uh, Coriolanus's cousin. Yeah. And uh, the grand. Oh, oh, I was gonna sorry. say the grandma. Okay. Um, just as like the two, the two um, direct family members that he still has. Yeah. Like with him. Yeah. There's definitely another grandma who's like pro capital at all times, and then Tigris who's a little more like there's good in everybody. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. But there, yeah. was, I mean, I sorry, I said Doctor Gall because there was one scene literally where they cut from like Doctor Gall having this like like one-on-one -on -one message with him, like this is how things are, power is everything, people are animals. And then they cut to Tigress and she's like, I just feel sad. Right. You know, it was like, oh, okay, they're the shoulder angels here. You have like the good side and the bad side. That's that. That's yeah. true. And so maybe maybe for the, the film's purposes, they they gave some of the grand mams like, because ult the grand mam inside of the story is sort of like, she's like, I want to go back to the old days. Like when yeah. your father was like the big wig and everything was amazing and we were wealthy and we could show that wealth and- Right blah, 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 like we want to be able to like present uh, in like a very showy kind of way. And then I think Tigris is much more like, this war was incredibly difficult, not just for the residents of Pan Am, but also for us here in the capital. We had to do some really dark and like difficult things mm. in order to like find our way through, yeah. you know? So like, we want to see the world um, improve as a result of this. Like yeah. this was the dark days <clears throat> for all of us, capital included, but like not not looking at the residents of the rest of the country yeah. as like less than. They inc they did, inc so the mo when the movie starts, they did include a scene in the movie that was not in the book. Which where is- Where they like show you like the dark days, like what young, what young Coriolanus and Tigris are doing like during the initial war before the Hunger Games have ever started. And they're like out on the streets, like collecting food. Collecting food. Yeah. I do think that in the book, there's a scene where they witness somebody like basically uh, turning to like cannibalism. Right. As like a, a means to sustain, which okay. is part of what they, they show. Yeah, us. I mean, like, they do show that in, yeah. the, in the movie right away. Um, they removed, I guess, or maybe just didn't include the part. Or there's a there's a mention in the book of uh, things Tigris had to resort to during the dark days yes. that was not present in the movie. Yeah, and um, that would be better. <laughs> I mean, they, yeah, that's that's a that's a complicated piece to work in. And like one of our big overall theories about Tigris in general, and in part of the, like I was almost excited for the film to come out because I was like, people are really going to start to appreciate Tigris as a character. And like because if if you're unaware, the kind of like cat like woman in Mockingjay that like takes in Katniss and yeah. her crew, that is Tigress. Right, that's the same character. That is the same character. And like, when you meet Tigress inside of the Mockingjay saga, you have no idea that this person is of any more prominence than the fact that she used to be uh, one of the designers, what is the word for it? The yeah, like stylist, the stylist. stylist yeah. Um, one of the stylists from the games. Yeah. Um, but like, so if you're just reading through the original Hunger Games saga, you don't know that this person is that significant to the overall story at all. So when I started reading Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes and I see Tigris's name show up, I'm like, like what? Really? Tigris is yeah. like 
one of the key characters inside of this story. I know, but you can like sort of piece it together such that you realize, well, if like Tigress was his cousin and they were like in it together, like going through these Hunger Games and like how did, and she was like one of the stylists and like one of the most famous ones, like how did she end up a rebel who just like sort of owns a shop? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's like, like what what was her like ultimate like fall from fall from grace? Yeah. And so the, the rough thought, the rough theory behind that and part of like what I think would have been worthwhile giving Tigress more screen time in terms of the film is that our rough idea is that um, and they even they even took it in a different direction at the end of the movie, where it seems like Tigress is like, you look just like your dad. And she had established earlier that to like look like your dad is to have like the evil, the darkness in his eyes. Right, yeah. So like, it seems like if you get to the end of Battle of Song, Words and Sakes film and you haven't read the, the books accompanying, you're probably just like, Pretty much Tigress sees through him by the right, end of the movie. Right, yeah. That's not really the case not in the, the book. Not the case, yeah. Um, he like returns home the hero and she's like right there for him. Right, and she's like, oh my gosh, Corio, you did it. Like, way yeah. to go. Um, but so our, our thought uh, on this one or the theory is that Tigress would basically grow up with Coriolanus where they bring the games to the prominence that you see them as in, you know, like Katniss's time. Um, and we know that Tigress stopped being a stylist, I believe about 10 years prior to Katniss showing up. Right. Um, and that would actually line up perfectly with Finnick O'Dair. Uh -huh. um, and as, as we all know, like Finnick is the one who shows up. He is a champion. He is basically beloved by the capital and he is basically then sold. Like his body is being sold by President Snow, like as like a like as like a trophy. It's like this is what we do with our victors. They, right. they are they, like they're toys for you. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, that to me <clears throat> is basically it hails back you know, if you're Tigress and you've mentored or been alongside Finnick through his games and you've seen him like grow and establish and then the use to which he is put to, it's kind of like- If you're Tigress who grew up and know that you had to do the same thing to survive during the war and like of all people, your cousin who knows about that is now doing that to the champions. It's, like it's there's like, no, like that's the breaking there's point. There's no, I literally just got chills. Know, it's, like, like, it's, it's, it's such a, it's such a dark concept. And it's like, it's, it's, as I it's was going so through. so dark, yeah. Right. Well, okay, so the other thing is that this movie is gratuitous with the violence, for it, sure. It, it is, yeah, yeah, go ahead, I'll yeah. let you talk. I mean, it, so it's like, I was watching through it and I was like, I mean, obviously the Hunger Games themselves are brutal, basically no matter what. Yes. But like, they're a much smaller, um, part of this movie overall, like you don't spend nearly as much time in the games themselves. And even when they're happening, so much of it's from Coriolanus' point of view instead of Lucy Gray's. Right. But like when you're watching the people like do the actual like fighting and the killing, like it's pretty brutal. And they, I mean, they they were just happy to have so many shots of gravity killing people in this movie. Like and we get to see just the thud. Yeah. And it was like, ugh. It, I mean, it's like hard to watch, but like that is of course the point. Like they didn't have as much time in the games to sell you on how terrible they were. So I felt like they're like, well, the violence speak for itself because like you're supposed to feel really uncomfortable. It is, and, yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah, it's like this, this is, the point is that it is not a spectacle. It is not a and, spectacle. Um, but that's also like, that's, that's even really clever like filmmaking too, because it's like, you know, like you, the audience are supposed to like, think like, yeah, this is not a spectacle. This is not good that they're making the kids like kill each other or whatever. Right. But like, that's also the problem the capital is dealing with, that it's not a spectacle. Right. Like they're trying to make it a spectacle where it's fun and there's pomp and circumstance. And it's like, obviously it's never really fun for anyone, but like they do, I mean, Coriolanus is basically directly responsible for the games becoming what they are. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, that's that's like a huge piece of, of you know, like, like, what is so difficult about him and his like overall charm and like the way that like you can you can sort of like find yourself like liking him as a character as it's like unfolding because it I mean it really comes down to uh, like Dean Highbottom who's played by Peter Dinklage um, who I thought was great oh yeah um, you know but like when you see the impact on his on Dean Highbottom's character by the end of the film and you and you resonate with like he came up with an idea while he was drunk. And that idea was then put into effect. I know, he was like, and, it's like, yeah, they're like having a conversation about like, what's the literal worst thing we could do? Right, yes, yeah. yeah. It's yeah. like, like let's let's think of things that are are so beyond reproach that like, like we would never do this. Yeah. This is just, this is just like the, the worst, this is the way to answer the question. This is right. the worst thing we could do. Um, but you get, you get in a sense the, uh, the, the responsibility, the burden that has now been laden on him for coming up with the idea in the first place. Like right. I came up with a truly awful thing and then it was implemented and I am now yeah, basically- Against my will. Right, but one way or another, I am now responsible for every single thing that happens. When you flip that with Coriolanus, it's like, 
He takes it one step further and basically gets people thrilled about watching what the Hunger Games are. Yeah. And that is awful. Yeah. Like, it's like the fact that what he successfully does is makes, because even the Capitol seems to be able to understand, this is not good. Like, we don't want to watch this. Like, this right. is not enjoyable. And he somehow influences them that they do want to watch it. And take, yeah. he like, he takes good people and makes them think bad thoughts. Like, right. I mean, like know. by the end, all the students are like, you know, chanting for like, let Lucy Gray out of the arena. Like she won, like end it. What are you doing? Right, right. Yes, right? exactly. Like, yeah. like you can still see that there's like this like human side to yeah. these people. Yeah, even I mean, like they, I mean, uh, yeah, so there, there is that. And it's like, clearly by the end, they're just, you know, they've, they've all been brainwashed and like the Hunger Games are the greatest thing ever. And we're so excited about them. And ugh. right. Yeah, it's been it's been brought to like the, yeah. you know, the nth degree. Um, and, and even in this like bizarro way, like when so we can back up a lot now and, and we'll basically go through and sort of talk about like the uh, like the introduction of Lucy Gray, like, you know, her situation at the reaping, basically yeah. the fact that like during this era of the Hunger Games, like you're not then like carted off to this like absolutely beautiful train car that's packed with food and like the most comfortable beds and right. You know, like they're treating stuff. like basically all of the district people like they're just savages and they're they're like sort of people, but like not really people. Right. Like there's yeah. there's not a lot of consideration because I think, you know, at this point in time, even the people who are putting the game games on are like, well, they're all just coming to, to basically die anyway. So like, why, like, well, why go to any waste resources on them? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So it's like, you know, they show up, you start to understand like the way that they're like wildly mistreated and like not even fed yeah, and they're, then like, they're like delivered to the zoo or they're right, where like, the, you know, on the train ride over, the one guy gets like a bat bite that like just kills him. Yeah. 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 Um, um, which, you know, is, is certainly a little bit symbolic of the, uh, the like, well, it's, it's this idea of, of poisoning, I think, basically, that sort of, like, permeates throughout the rest of, of the story. Oh, well, like, even that was, like, such a good thing. It's, like, yeah, like that the way in which Snow fights is, like, through these, like, stealth tactics with, like, poison and stuff like that. Which right. is, you know, you learn in the Hunger Games books that, like, that's how he sort of rose to power by, like, poisoning his opponents or whatever and right. all of that. And, like, you, you hear that he's done it and you know that he has, like, the blood sores in his mouth and that's why he wears the rose to cover up the smell of the blood because he drinks the poison too but he knows it's there so he can like you know take an antidote or whatever right but like you know when you see him poison dean highbottom at the end and he gives lucy gray the poison it's like it solves a lot of his problems yes yeah yeah, yeah. like he's he's definitely i mean like the 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 snake symbolism is extremely oh, I mean, it's, it's extremely it's, prominent it's, it's extremely numbers. giant Giant vat of symbolism there. <laughs> <laughs> like a comically large vat comically of symbolism. Comically large vat of snakes. Yeah, yeah. Oh, man. Um, but so, yeah, the, we get the introduction uh, to Lucy Gray, who is played by... Um, Rachel Zegler. Rachel Zegler, yep. who I thought basically just crushed it. Yeah, I thought um, so, too. I mean, she was great. Yeah, I mean, truly. I think her and Coriolanus, who is played by Tom Blith. Blyth? Yeah. Blyth? Blyth? Yeah. Tom Blythe, man, both of them, amazing. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that they did a really, really, really amazing job of like making them both the characters that you pretty much read about in you know this in in the books. Yeah, I like, mean, so many of their conversations were just like like I've, I've read the book, I've listened to it, and like you're watching them play it out. They're like word for word having the conversations from the book, and they're just like pulling it off. Like so so often, I think when I see conversations that are moved from page to book, they're like they happen like too fast, or like the characters like like they read the words or their interpretation didn't feel right or something. But like I thought, I was like, Man, yeah, you two are just crushing it. Yeah, like, the, like the, you basically got the. You've, you've basically got the tone. Yeah. And then like so many of their lines too have to have this like down the middle, you don't know what they mean by what they're saying uh -huh. about them. Yeah. Like, especially at the very end where like all the climax is about to happen and they're about to go into the woods and it's like, you know, she's talking to him. She's like, but it's raining. And she's like, well, I'm not made of sugar. And it's like, it's like, mm. like the way she delivered that line was like so good. You're like, is she just being like, you know, funny and coy about it? Or is she just like, I'm going out, you're dead to me. Right, you know, right, it's like yeah. that. But of course, that's the point. You really aren't supposed to know. Yeah, and, and I think that like, that's that's definitely like the ambiguity that I think is supposed to be like included all, all throughout the saga. Because like even, yeah. even like, you know, as Coriolanus is, is like protecting Lucy Gray during the games itself and like the impulses that he has and like the way in which you're like, you're like, he cares for her. Like he wants her to survive. But like, and, and it's like, I think the, what is so perfect about that is that like he does, but it's like, 
he is still also being selfish. Like he has grown to care for her. Right. Like, Lucy Gray. Right. He does, like, does he like her? He does like her. He right. does care deeply for her. But it is still, like, a very, like, like, if it wasn't Lucy Gray, he would be still motivated to win the game. Exactly. And, and, like, that's what yeah. he would. They do that a lot. They're like, okay, there's no Plinth Prize. Do you still care if she lives? And it's like, you don't even get a solid answer. Like, there's, like, there's this, like, five-minute gap where the Plinth Prize is off the table, and it's like, does Corio still care about winning the games or not? And then, like, three minutes later, Dr. Gall's like, if you do this, I'll put your name back in for the prize. And then it's like, he's right back in it. But it's like, in the meantime, did he care? We don't know. We don't know, yeah. And yeah. I, I, I still think he does, but I yeah. think, again, it's like, it's like it is still motivated by by like some amount of well I I want her like right you and know. this this is something in the books that's a lot more present that they didn't really put into the movie I'm not sure how you would have because it's mostly like self narrated sort of thing in the books but he he like refers to her as my girl a lot in the books and not in a way that like oh that's my girl it's like she is possess I I, I possess, possess her, her. Yeah. yeah and they they do like when they're doing the reaping and they're basically assigning like each person they do they do use the phrasing which I thought was a nice like inclusion is and the girl from district 12 belongs to Coriolanus they Snow. did yes and, I was like ooh that and, was good wording yes. that's exactly how he feels about it yes and and I think that that was the way that the the film was able to yeah. sort of be yes. like look we can't tell you that Coriolanus thinks that she is his but like that is that is how he views her yeah. um, as, as you kind of like dig into it there. Yeah. I was, I was pretty impressed throughout the movie though, because like when you watch the hunger games, one of the, one of the hardest things they have to overcome is that when you're reading it, so much of it is like, you get all of Katniss's like inner monologue and like, right. you know, she's not talking to anyone. So you just get to hear what she's thinking. And it's like, how do they demonstrate that on screen so that you know what's motivating her all the time. And the same is true in the Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes where Coriolanus walks into every conversation and you can like, you know, you know, hear inside of his mind as he notices things in the room or the way people are talking or the, you know, the arc of their shoulders or whatever. Right. And like to help him navigate whatever's going on. And it's like, you, that helps you stay on track with like what all the decisions he's making. And in the movie, of course, you can't do that. But I felt like they did a great job of making sure at all times you knew like why he was motivated to say what he was saying. And like, they would always make sure you knew when he was lying like to someone else. Like yes. they would like have him have a conversation over here and then he'd go talk to them and he'd be like, oh, you're lying because you want this to happen. Uh, and it was like, it was, it was very well done, I thought, because a lot of times what they do in the Hunger Games movies is they just cut to Haymitch and he'll be like, ah, oh, here's what she's thinking. Yeah, right, you know? right, right. <laughs> well, and a great example of this is when he first walks, he, he basically, he gets up for Reaping Day, he's all dressed up. He walks to, you know, the university where the event is supposed to happen. He runs into Clemencia and basically she's like, why are you sweating? He's like, "We, it's Reaping Day. We gave the driver the day off. And it's like, it's like, you know that there is no driver. Right. Like you just saw inside of like the sparse kitchen with like the empty fridge right. and all the rest. And then like he <laughs> walks in. Like he's like, we had to throw out half the steaks. Yeah, yeah. Something. yeah. Well, well, that's the thing. Yeah. So the next thing is they're like, they, they walk in and you know, he like glances over at like the buffet that's like laid out and it's a ton of food. And she's like, are you hungry? And he's like, oh no, I, you know, the, the chef made steak this morning and we had, you know, like whatever. And so it's like, what's happening is like in this situation, what you, what you, the viewer has now learned so quickly about this guy is that he did not have steak for breakfast. Like he right. is starving. Like right. he's looking at the food because he desperately <laughs> wants food. Right. Um, but you can also then like, you understand like this is someone who cares about how things are viewed. Like what the perception of him is at all times. Right. He's always in control. Yeah. And I think that like, then you have these like little moments with Dean Highbottom to your point where like, you know, then a few minutes later you find Coriolanus out like sort of like sequestered away and he has like food and he's eating it. And that's when Dean Highbottom comes over and he's like, you're like, he sees through all of it. Right. He's like, you're, you're fixed up shirt, you know, like this, that, the mm -hmm. other. He's like, I, yeah, I know the you're, game you're too playing too close boy. fitting shoes or whatever. Right. Yeah. 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 Like he's, whatever. he's seeing through the illusion. It's such, the, the Dean Highbottom thing is really, is I thought well done too, because like you, like when you're seeing everything from Snow's point of view, it seems like he's a bad guy, but by the end you realize that he just hates everything about all of this. Yes. And yeah. this is the question that I would have for viewers who had not also read the books already, because like when you've read the book, you know, the whole time. Time that Dean Highbottom um, is 
in opposition to the games from the very beginning. But if you don't know that going into the movie, this is something that I was I was unable to determine because they're also walking a line. Like, yeah. you know that Dean Highbottom works for the university. You know that the, the university in Pan Am is the one that like puts on uh, all of the Hunger Games. And so like your belief or understanding might be that, um, Oh my gosh, what's her name? Um, who is the... Uh, Dr. Gall? Yes, Dr. Yes. Gall. You know that Dr. Gall and him might be like a little bit like in opposition about like tactics and stuff like yeah. that. But like, you still... Do, did you, you believe... You still think he's pro-Hunger Games. Yeah, exactly, yeah. that's the question. Do you still believe that like he is, he is basically for it? Because that is that is otherwise kind of a reveal at the end where it's like, he's not, you know? Like he he sort of like got, got sucked into this vortex and right. now he's just trying to he's survive He's sort of in the it. same position Snow is in most of the time where it's just like, well... This is my job, and you know, if I if I if I speak out against it, I'll lose everything. So I really can't, but I'll try and do what I can to stop it in the meantime. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Speaking of which, what did you think about Sejanus in the uh, movie? Okay, so Sejanus, I thought I would say I think the actor did phenomenally. Yeah. I thought I thought he was like it, it wasn't how I pictured Sejanus, but I was like by the end of it, I was like, now it is. Yeah. Um, which I thought was cool. But the thing about Sejanus in the books, and the thing about Sejanus as a character is that Sejanus is right. Like, oh, he, yeah. like he has the right opinion, the right views, like his opposition is correct. Yes. Like, and, but the thing that they do in the books that I didn't think transferred as well to the screen is that like, he almost comes across as this like nag or like a downer or something as he should because the Hunger Games is awful. Right. But like when Coriolanus is so like, you know, upbeat and proper and cool and yeah. suave and, and you know, he has all these like characteristics. Sometimes he sees Sejanus and you're like, oh, come on, man, can you like, just like, I know. can you just give it a rest? And then it's like, but it's like, but no, but but no. Right. But the thing I thought about Sejanus in the film was that I was like, he's too compelling. Like, it's like everything I, he's that saying. That is exactly it. It's like, the, it, yeah, I guess okay, so what I wrote down, yeah, I'm so maybe I'll just read it out here. Is like, in the book, he seems a lot more like kind and innocent with like a heart of gold while in the movie his position is still very understandable but he's so angry and obvious all the time it's like almost no surprise in the movie that he gets caught oh yeah right yeah. right yeah, you know, yeah it's yeah. like he, he's like he's you know in the books he's like he's upset all the time basically but you're sort of just like dude you were like yeah like come on you're right he kind of comes off as like a bit of a nag right it's like you like you know, he's so nice all the time. And like, you know, he's correct, but like somehow like Snow always is able to like talk some sense into him and stuff. It's like, he's just so angry all the time in the movie that it's like, yeah, I, I don't know. It wasn't, I mean, he's still obviously correct overall. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah and, and, and basically the way that he's, he's going about like opposing everything that's going on. But, um, you know, he, Sejanus again is another one of these examples where we don't see nearly as much of it in the film, but we, what you learn about in the books is that he also has the two parents rule where he yes. has one, his-, his, his uh, Ma Plinth. Ma Plinth is like incredibly nice. And she, she too, like, holds true to things that she loved about her life in District 2, even though she now finds herself in this incredibly prominent position inside of the Capitol. Whereas like the father is sort of like the one who is like known for basically buying yeah. Sejanus's way out of just every problem, Any problem known to man. Into, yeah. um, which is something that I do feel like they harped on really heavily. <laughs> like it was basically Coriolanus's like key uh, counter to everything Sejanus said. Like, well, it's easy for you to say, your dad can just buy your way out of it. Like, yeah, and which keeps being true. Which also keeps being true, but like, even as a viewer, again, like we we know, like we we typically don't see the spoiled brat character as the one that you stand behind. Right. But like in this case, once again, it's sort of like it's like Sejanus is spoiled. He does have like a life that most of the people, uh, like you know, like, well, not even I can't speak for everybody, but like for Coriolanus, like Coriolanus knows the hardship he's he's going through, even yeah. if the rest of his classmates have no idea right. because he's putting on such a good act. But um, that is like one of those things where it's like usually the the child of the of the rich kid who can get you out of all of your problems is not the one that's like that guy. He's the one who's got it. <laughs> right. He's, yeah. Usually it's the the scrappy one who's like, yeah, coming from a worse situation. Right. Right. Yeah, right. Which, yeah. Usually it's the Coriolanus character who you're rooting so, for. So I, I actually think it's it's a it's a clever <laughs> piece of storytelling where you've taken those two tropes and you flip them on their head in a way yeah, that is, is right. a little bit different. Where um yeah, the it's, it'd be like if Malfoy was the one opposing Voldemort. <laughs> right. And right, Harry yes. was like secretly <laughs> just like, yeah, yeah, like Death Eaters. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, wait a minute. No, that's not it. <laughs> 
<laughs> um, yeah, that's, that was literally what it's like because he even has the blonde hair. Anyway, you're right. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's like it's like a dead ringer. You get inside of the games. You know, I thought that. Uh, oh, we meet. Uh, we meet Lucky Flickerman. Oh, um, dude, I thought he was great. Jason Schwartzman, he just I crushed it. He. This was a prime example of having a top tier actor inside of a blockbuster flick who is just quite literally out acting every other person on screen, and <laughs> not because everybody else on screen wasn't doing a good job, but because he was just amazing. Dude, like, he was so good. Like in the book, he's kind of like an annoying, blustering idiot. And it's like, he's still kind of an idiot. Oh, he, yeah, right, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Like he is not understanding the, like he's sort of like, like he's not understanding the gravitas of the situation. He's just more like, it's all about me all the time. Well, he's yeah. like, yeah, this, this is an example of somebody who's like, I've been called up to the big leagues. Like, and I am yeah. not wasting uh, this opportunity. Like I am now prominent. I am now featured. This is exactly what I always wanted I, in my I wildest love he, weatherman dreams. I love when he's on the phone with the restaurant. In the high chair. In the high chair. <laughs> when he says like, yeah, we need two in a high chair. And then he's like saying, can you push my reservation back? The games have gone longer than I thought. <laughs> like he thought the games be completely over and like even when he's in the conversation he's like yeah do you have any openings later tonight as if like yeah i thought it, i thought the game would be over by seven it'll probably be more like nine like the whole, right, whole yeah. games are gonna end in the next hour right right yeah and i'll well, still make dinner the thing he's preoccupied with is <laughs> right. dinner reservation right, like he doesn't care about the kids dying at all i'm like oh yeah i thought i thought he did fantastic it was so funny all the time too it really was yeah. it really was yeah which is which is amazing because um as you fast forward again to like katniss's times like caesar flickerman yeah. uh played by stanley Chuchi, Chuchi, yeah. is is also a spectacular performance. The, the Flickerman like, casting is, is just dead on. Yeah, dead like, on. It, they are so good. And I don't know if like this is something that the filmmakers like know and understand is that like what you need inside of the Capitol is sort of like like because Caesar Flickerman uh, like has this unique way of coming across as like understanding. Like he does feel like he cares about the people. Like yeah. he does seem like leaned in. Like he seems like you know he's still bought into like the Capitol propaganda. Like oh the Hunger Games what a spectacle. Like yeah. this is something to be excited about. But also like, you know, has the otherwise like connection with with each of the right. you know people as they as they come through and does a good job interviewing and stuff. But yeah, so I think I think this is something that they're like, this character is like, while maybe not the main character, while not prominent, like necessarily. In like his he, mind, he's the main character. In, in his mind, he's the main character. <laughs> yeah. But I think like they know that this is a character to put uh, mm -hmm. filmmaking resources into and they do and it works. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I, I that was like one of those where I was just like, every single time he says something, it's like, God, that was the most tactless thing ever. I know. But it was like, but it's also oddly perfect in oh. its own twisted way. This was something, I didn't know if this was like a, a thing or not, but like if you ever try and look up maps of Pan Am, which sometimes we do for, you know, making the videos and stuff, like there's never like a real official map. Right, you know, all the ones you find are fan made. And like, he's doing the weather report and they zoom out on the nation. And I was like, oh my God, that's like an official canon map all of a sudden. Now we know. Like there it is, whoa, Now we see it, yeah. Yeah, so I thought that was true. I was like, I, I felt like that was like a nod. I don't, I don't know. My read was that like somewhere, like within the fandom, they are aware that they haven't shown you the official map like or what something. It looks like, yeah. And they're like, we're yeah. just gonna throw it in the weather report to be like, hey, hey, look, we did it. We gave you the map. <laughs> now you've seen. <laughs> like, what all Pan Am looks like. What, where the districts actually are. And like, what the, one thing I immediately noticed, cause you know you're in North America. So I was like, okay, so like, where is District 12 like in relation? Cause like, at, you know, where we live in Virginia is very District 12, we're nearby. You know, we are we are on the we AT. Live, we live in the, in the Appalachian, Appalachian Mountains. Mountains. Yeah, so I was like, do we live where District 12 is? So I was trying to see where District 12 was in relation to Florida. And what I noticed immediately on the map is like, there's no Florida. So <laughs> Florida's gone. Oh, man. So one of the theories about like what happens in uh, in the war, or, like maybe what causes it is that like the oceans rise. Oh yeah. And so right. that they like actually, so the, the, the country itself is just smaller, which then, you know, it would make sense if the oceans rose enough like certain states just sort of go off the map altogether, which so that to me, that to me suddenly became a much more viable theory about like what initially causes 
whatever war happens sure. is like some amount of climate change, the oceans rise and literally the beaches, you know, the, the, the nation shrinks because some of it goes underwater. Right, right, right. Yeah. yeah. Which so then almost makes the Appalachian Mountains like one of a natural, a pretty natural wall. Interestingly, I actually feel like this is something that is showcased and maybe intentionally inside of Katniss's first games. But there's, you know, if you picture a dome that is the games, like Katniss's like whole thing is just like, I'll start in the middle and I'm just gonna keep going this way. And then the game makers are like, nope. And they basically like they squish in the oh, dome yeah. itself. And it's like mm. if, if that's like the water level rising and you want to understand why conflict happened, it's because a whole bunch of people were forced Shoved, from their safety yeah. and Wow, how thematic. I'm so bought in on this. Giant flood. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. giant flood represents the flood. giant flood is the games. You giant know, flood which is the games. I guess by the end of the movie, Coriolanus basically does say, like, th like the, the games are not the games. Life is Life the games. Is the games. And I, I am, am the, the victor. victor. Oh boy. <laughs> okay, so uh, the um the other thing that I thought was I was so curious to see how they were gonna do was Lucy Gray's disappearance at the end. Yes. Because like so in the in the book you get like the full ballad of Lucy Gray and there's like conversations about it and they really want to make sure you understand you usually like look at the lyrics and stuff and that that's, that helps that that's one of those examples where i think that like 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 books as an art form i think in this particular capacity especially with what i think you're about to say yeah. it's like it's like where i think it's the correct medium for this story like the book itself yeah. because because the ballad of Lucy Gray is critically important to yeah, to the end to how you interpret the ending yeah and it gets kind of reduced to like a 30 second conversation where they start uh, there's like a montage of them traveling out to the lake or something and the you're you can hear um lucy gray singing the ballad of lucy gray right and then it just sort of cuts to them but like you might not even because it's like a montage you might not even be aware that you should be paying attention to the lyrics actually singing them right. it was like one of those i was like i really wish i had captions on i know yeah, yeah the captions would have been nice i thought the yeah, same thing yeah that would have been good so if you're watching it at home put captions on uh, but then he sort of like they cut to them sort of just like laying together next to the lake and he's like does she survive in the song and it's sort of like oh wait was i supposed to be paying attention to the song right and yeah, that's that's yeah. the movie that's the actors nudging you to being like hey th those words yeah. those were important they're yeah. Those like, are thematic. Right, yeah. Lucy Gray disappearing and you not knowing, that's gonna happen. It's foreshadowing. Yeah, but, but not yeah. just not just lost. So the Ballad of Lucy Gray, when you read it, is the story of a girl who goes out and gets lost in the snow. Right. As yes. in as so like, like like it's very on the nose, but it's also kind of interesting because like the way and that this is what Lucy Gray explains to um Corey Lannis in the film is that she's like, it's a mystery. Like, that's the whole point. Like, yeah. You know, it's like, like, does she? Like, I, I like know. the things she does. Yeah. Um, and then like, even this is, I, I couldn't tell, maybe they said it in the lyrics in the movie, but like part of the, um, the way the, the song ends is that like, you're, like um, you're looking at her footsteps in the snow and they suddenly like disappear. And like literally snow was like following her footsteps and they disappeared. I was like, that was cleverly done. Yes, it was. I like that, that was, I don't, I, cause I, got, I was like, oh, I wish I knew if it was in the lyrics or if that was like a nod to the book and the actual song or whatever. So that being said though, <clears throat> the thing that I think like, like that, that I feel like the movie did in a way that the book is much more subtle about is I would say my interpretation of the film is Lucy Gray survives. Oh yeah, like, I I feel like that is like that. I was yeah. It was it. So when you're reading the book, I think the the ending is more suited to a book because you can. There are so many layers at stake by the time you get to the climax where you re, like like you can tell Suzanne Collins does not want you to have. Like on, on every point, everything you could point at to say, no, Lucy Gray turned on him first or no, it was him first. Right. Like there is like a, an air of mystery. So like in the in the movie, he finds that orange scarf, scarf. on the ground and he picks it up and there's a snake and it bites him. It's right. like, that's also true. And like in the movie, it looks incredibly intentional. It looks like a by trap. By Lucy Gray yeah. to the trap. Es but especially as someone who we've seen on numerous occasions have handling, a, a, a handling snakes. Right, yeah. exactly. But in the, in, in the book, it's like a torn piece of the scarf. And like, he goes to look at it and there's like a snake on the log next to it or something. Right. right. It's like, it's less like, if you pick this up, you're gonna get bit and more like, it could have been a trap or an accident. Right, yeah. Like it's a torn piece of cloth. Did she tear it or did it get ripped? Did she put the snake there or was it just a snake in the woods? Like, you're not quite sure. Uh, and like this one, like you see him shoot and like he definitely hits her and then it's, which also adds to the mystery of like, is she alive or dead? Cause clearly she was shot, but was she 
dead. Yeah, well, yeah. And, and in this case, well, the thing that felt like the like the ringer to me is that you basically get to the end of the film and then you hear a voiceover from, you know, adult Coriolanus Snow, President Snow, yeah. saying um, it's like the things we love the most, most that destroy us. That destroy oh, us. Oh my gosh, yeah. So that isn't present in the books either. But when, the, I mean, first of all, hearing Adult Snow talk at the end of the movie gave me chills. It was like, oh, that was awesome. That right, was super yeah, cool. What wow. a great touch. Yeah. However, it super duper made me think that like the uh, Lucy Gray becomes coin theory was like, like, oh, like that really makes you think that all of a sudden because yeah. like, that was the thing he loved the most, and Coin is who destroys him. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And and so that's that's sort of like as you as you start to like zoom back on this this like you know bigger conversation about like how everything ultimately comes together. Like we've we've made a it's a nearly hour long video that we titled like Coin's Master Plan. Yeah. Um. And the the rough thought basically is that like. At the end of Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes, we know that like Lucy Gray mysteriously has an outcome of some kind. And, right. and inside of the context <clears throat> of the theory, like we're basing it off the books where it's it's very not clear whether or not Coriolan is successfully Killed took her, her down. Now. Yeah, I really, honestly, last night what I thought they were gonna do because of the snake bite was that he was gonna have like hallucinations of some kind. Oh, where, like, sure. You saw him think he shoots her and then he goes to check and she's not there. And I thought they were gonna suddenly have her like appear all over the place. Oh, as yeah. if he's like hallucinating, like, wait, did he get her or not? Right. Oh, that's yeah. interesting. I, and, and I almost think they should have started the the mocking Jay thing a little bit sooner so that you weren't sure. Because like the way it happens is like he shoots her, he goes to check, she's disappeared, and then he's going through the woods, and then the song starts. And it's like, well, so it's clearly she's alive because she starts the song. Right, right. Yeah, yeah that, that's at least how it how it plays. Yeah. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's like maybe you don't know if she survives on her own or with a gun wound or something. Right, yeah. right. But you you have a lot of like the symbols in place, which is which is effectively like this idea of the mocking jay versus the snake. And yeah. you know, the the idea as you then press forward and you like eventually find yourself at Katniss's game. The big question that you have in mind is that like, and this is this was like the thing that slowly started to stand out to me after reading Ballad is that like every single thing about Katniss's character and her selection and her position and what she represents, like all of it pieces together almost too perfectly. Like it, like Katniss, Katniss is so the ultimate foil to President Snow yeah. that it can't be a mistake. It, right, like, it, it doesn't feel accidental. And it's like, it wouldn't even work, it maybe doesn't work as well in the movie canon and stuff, but like things down to the fact that like in the book, it's uh, Madge, the mayor's daughter, which not even that is like, oh yeah, Coriolanus killed the mayor's daughter. <laughs> Oh yeah, right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And then the mayor's daughter is the one who yeah. ultimately gives Katniss the pin. Yeah, in, in the books. Yeah, at least. in the books, yeah. Madge is the one who gives Katniss the pin, and it happens to be the Mockingjay. And it's sort of like the the mayor is sort of revealed to be like a little bit more of a sympathetic character towards the the rebels in district, or to like the the district people in District Twelve. Right. And so it's like conceivably he's in contact with District Thirteen, and maybe knows a little bit more of the truth, and that's where the pin came from. And like it's all part of setting Katniss herself up as the as the Mockingjay at right. some point. Yeah. Because then like, Cinna is the one who like, makes sure she has that pin on, you know? Right. And Cinna like, chooses to go to District 12, even though it's his first year, and they're the worst district. What that is, okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and then Cinna ends up being like the ultimate. We also know that like, going into catching fire, at the very least, like, Cinna has already done the designs for the Mockingjay outfit. Right. Um, and so that means that like going into Catching Fire, he's clearly already had contact with Plutarch, who was already a game maker for the 74th Hunger Games, which and, means yeah. that like, you know, you, you may have You been, know that Plutarch's been a rebel for much longer than the last year. Exactly, right. exactly. Like it, it takes more than a year to put together arenas, right. I think is what he, he tells Katniss. So that's also part of the theory is that like when you get into the arena, it's like Katniss locks out so much that it's basically her backyard that they're fighting in. Right. And it's like, did she luck out or did super persuasive Plutarch Heavens be a game maker who has the right ear of Seneca Crane convince him that this was the arena for this year because now is the time to act. Or, right. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So there's, there's, it's like, I mean, you, we could get into it, I know, but yeah, I feel like we're not talking about the movie anymore. I know. <laughs> yeah. Like you, you have to get, you have to get so deep into it, but I do highly recommend you <clears throat> check out that theory because I think it's like, it's supported in so many different ways. And I think it demonstrates the ultimate chess match between President Coin <clears throat> and Snow. But I feel like the point of Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes to bring us back to the original equation is why this chess match is taking place in the first place. And that to me is like, I feel like especially what the movie seemed to illustrate is that almost certainly Lucy Gray escapes and either 
ultimately becomes President Coin or is like the catalyst for someone like President Coin to exist at all. Right. Um, even like even the fact that like District 13, everything about them is gray and she's Lucy Gray. She's Lucy Gray, but she is otherwise like emblazoned with uh, like rainbow. Right. And I feel like, you know, when they're going into the woods, Coriolanus is having a conversation and he accidentally reveals the fact that he's killed three people, not yeah. two. And when she's like, wait a second, you said you killed three people. I only know of two. Like Coriolanus, don't lie to me. Like who's the third person you've killed? And what he responds with is myself. I killed the old me so I could come with you out on this journey. Right. And it's like, it's interesting because he's saying that in that situation because it's a lie. And the question is, if Coriolanus killed Lucy Gray at the end, it's like he did not physically kill her, I don't think. I think he killed who yeah. Lucy Gray was. Right. There's even like a description of like the color of Coin's eyes as like um like slush. Yeah, it's like yeah. it's like melted snow. Like melted yeah. snow, and it's like, ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like yeah, it's the color of snow. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. How about that? Uh-huh. How about Wait, that? It's the color of gray snow. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, I got it. I see what you're going. Susan Collins, I'm on to you. Right, right. Yeah. So anyway, I mean, I think I, to me, I think that's how everything really starts piecing together. If you're wondering whether or not Katniss is related to any of the original characters, we got very little oh, of the character of Maud Ivory. Yeah, I really thought she'd be, a, I really thought they would like hint at it a little more for you. Well, and what was interesting is that they leaned in rather heavy inside of the film to the Hanging Tree song they being did. like created. But the whole idea of the Hanging Tree song and Maud Ivory Ivory and how the hanging tree is relevant inside of Katniss's time is that inside of the books, the only person who hears um, the hanging tree is Maud Ivory. And right. Maud Ivory specifically has this unique talent of being able to learn a song the um, very first time she hears it. Right. And so the idea is that like Maud Ivory would then be the only one capable of knowing the hanging tree song and being able to carry it forward in time after Lucy Gray had created it. Right. And ultimately go on to become Katniss's paternal grandfather, grandmother. Grandmother, yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, Maud Ivory, who we don't see a lot of in the movies, we see more of in the books, uh, would be Katniss's dad's mom. Yeah. Um, is, is I think most likely how all of that sort of fits together. Um, and even the fact that like Katniss's last name is Everdeen, there's like a naming convention inside of- Yeah, the uh, Covey. The Covey that it's colors. But I feel like Everdeen is probably a small modification to what I suspect was Evergreen. Yeah. Um, and that would that would still maintain- uh, Yeah, like sort that of sort of coveyness about that, it. Yeah, exactly. So, so yeah, uh, if Katniss is related to anyone, it's uh, Maud Ivory, not Lucy Gray. Not Lucy Gray. Um, yeah. But they're, you know, sort of one family. If yeah. you will. I mean, <laughs> that's that the name of the wind. Good, like, good little anyway. name of the wind reference. But, uh, dude, I'll tell you what though, when when she held up the roots and I was like, oh my God, they're about to say the word Katniss. I was like, it gave me chills when they finally did. Okay. Cause it was like, and also the way they did it, she's like, oh, it's too early for Katniss. And it's like, it is too early for Katniss. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that's like one of those things where I think it's very possible that you might be looking at the story and think that that was uh, fan service, but I don't no, think no. It, I don't think it is. Because no. again, going back to the idea of Maude, She's the one who brought over the Katniss roots and Katniss's father is the one who teaches Katniss how to go to this lake, to that lake. where she is named after the swamp potatoes, the swamp potatoes, aka Katniss, Katniss. plant. Yeah. Um, and so it's like there, that whole situation. And I don't think in the films we get to go to that lake at all or see no, the, the I don't hut. think we do like in the Hunger Games movies. Yeah. yeah I don't think um, so. Yeah, but it's a fairly prominent location in the, in the Hunger Games books. It is a fairly prominent yeah. location. Like that's like where Katniss goes to like sort of like escape away from everything, which again feels like something that she would know about because the Covey knows about it and that's exactly. how it would be like passed down. Yeah, and sometimes. like not many people know about it, just the Covey. They even say that in the movie. Yes, so. yeah. The other thing uh, that I think is kind of interesting is that I actually found District 12 to be more inviting during this particular era than yes. what we see inside of, uh, you know, the time frame 64 years later when Katniss shows up. I actually think that that is also very intentional and something we don't get explicitly explained inside of the movie. But basically after the murder of the mayor's daughter, I think that they completely ban and outlaw performances. And so yeah. like this idea of people being like musicians and like like there being like a recreational place to go and sort of like the 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 lifestyle that District 12 um occupants would have known and and maybe enjoyed, you know, or the traditions yeah. that they were forming, mm-hmm. I think is something that President Snow then subsequently as he rises to power, like he is going to extraordinary lengths to make sure that life in District 12 is as bad as possible. Yeah, they like being music. Yes, right? yeah. yeah. Of any kind from um, District 12. <laughs> like, oh, that sucks. Yeah, so it's, yeah. It's, it's, really, it's really rather harsh, but in case you were wondering at all, like, man, it seems like District 12 
seems almost more inviting during it was this time much brighter frame. it was yeah, a lot brighter it was like greener yeah. and stuff um so what you're seeing based on Katniss's <clears throat> time is basically decades upon decades of of you know repression to this this district yeah in particular yeah, so. so by the time we get to Katniss, things are real bad yeah so yeah. the the only thing that i feel like we've we've danced around and haven't talked about maybe enough given that it's the hunger games movie is the hunger games themselves okay. inside of the movie because yeah. i then and then we could probably like work our way towards our, our ratings and, and Sure. out but um i thought it was kind of cool the way that they that you go into the arena you see uh, i feel like inside of the book maybe the arena was already like a little bit blown up so there was already like some there was some like debris from the past nine games yeah, yeah like some rubble yeah. and, and and stuff like that because i think otherwise like they don't even clean the arena between yeah events. like they like just let the just, bodies lay there it's just a coliseum yeah. and and yeah it's it that's that so it was kind of interesting to see um the thing i actually kind of liked was you know they go in they're touring the arena they're looking around they're noticing that there's really basically nowhere to hide which is probably why caesar flickerman thought he could make those not caesar flickerman uh lucky flickerman thought he could make that yeah. dinner reservation because right. otherwise it's yeah. just a big circle. Just a big circle. Yeah. There's um, yeah. I mean, even um, Lucy Gray is just like, where am I going to go? There's nowhere to hide. You know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So you go in, basically everything explodes. But the thing I thought was kind of interesting was like, like right dead center is what appears to be like a cornucopia. Yeah. Uh, in the form of like the, the rocks. Like it's, yeah. it's not like super, super like shaped that way, but like you can kind of be like, oh, I see what they're I getting see, there. I see what's, I see what's happening. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's the middle. Um, but yeah, then inside of the games themselves, I thought that they did a really good job of sort of like showing some of the more prominent, you know, characters that we saw inside of you know, right. Lucy's game, sort mm -hmm. of like, like you had your own version of like the career pack right. uh, led by Coral. Uh, and, you know, then seeing like a little bit of the divide from the District 7, um, uh, lumber territory where yeah. one of them joined the career pack while the other one sort of like stepped aside and yeah. you know sort of like had to had to fend them off and stuff. Um, who is it? Thresh. Thresh is in the Hunger Games. Thresh is in the so Hunger Games. Reaper. Reaper. Reaper yeah. is in in this one. Um, Reaper, I think, <clears throat> is like he in the books. There's there's like any they do it in the movies, but like I like the way they do it in the books just a little bit more, which is that like basically from the beginning, Reaper, who is regarded as like the most dangerous person in the games, the one who they believe will win, is basically the one that like continuously throughout keeps taking the dead bodies and lining them up, yeah. which, which they do do in the movie, but yeah. he's doing it like the whole time. And it's like, every time somebody dies, it's sort of like, there's Reaper, he shows up in the middle and he's gonna, right. you know, not bury him, but line them all up and sort of give Make them- Make sure, yeah, they're like always visible. Right, yes, yeah, yeah exactly. Um, but the the thing, the, the giant, yeah. The thing that I, I liked the least about the Hunger Games themselves was actually the arrival of the gigantic comically large vat of snakes. Oh yeah. Um, like that, it was like the one thing that I was like <clears throat> that, like I imagined like a tank full of snakes and uh, maybe I just pictured them like to be slightly larger. I did not picture what was approximately based on my, you know, my, my experience with aquariums, like a, a, like an 8,000 gallon container literally filled to the brim with snakes. Uh huh. That's a lot of snakes. I mean, it's a lot of snakes, but honestly, it was it was what I was expecting. Oh, it was what yeah, you were expecting. Yeah, okay. that was. I was. I think they set it down and let it sit there for a while to like build some tension. I think in the books they just sort of drop it and it like explodes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The snakes are just going everywhere. Yeah, I thought. I thought the way in which the snakes were killing people, they were like that where they had to just sort of like engulf them like a river and they just sort of disappeared. I was like, that was a little cheesy. Yeah, yeah, um, it's, yeah. it's like, it, like, cause I mean, I think even if you're bit by a venomous snake and even what you don't see inside, <laughs> you know, like when Clemencia puts her hand in the tank and she gets bit uh, for, for trying to take credit for Coriolanus's report earlier yeah. on in the movie, like, Normally that comes back and is like yeah. prominent in its own way, like later on in the story. It, it's like, did she just die? I think in the movie I think, she just I died. think in the movie she just died, yeah. In the in the book, uh, what happens is she starts turning into sort of like a snake creature yeah, kind so of it, thing. This is this is like the mutts yeah. being created. That's, yeah. that's Dr. Gall's like whole yeah, um, kind of thing. So, and it's like, either way, I think she does, I don't know if she dies in the book too or not, but either way, the the point is that Dr. Gall just sucks. Yeah. Um, yeah. And her dying immediately for claiming, for basically um, plagiarizing a paper uh, or taking credit for a paper she didn't write, definitely doesn't seem like a death sentence kind of thing. Right. Uh, yeah, I think that's really all they're trying to drive home in the movie. And even in the book, it's sort of like, yeah, Dr. Gall went too far. Uh, man, we haven't talked about Dr. Gall really at all, because I thought her performance was 
awesome. Yeah, Viola Davis. <laughs> yeah. I mean, oh my it, gosh. That's just that. I mean, it it was it was very incredible. Yeah. Like, like there's like startling there, evil. <laughs> yes, it was like it was a kind of like um, harnessed derangement. Yeah. Um, which was which was very interesting. Like the 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 idea of like a mad scientist sort of just being like given way too much license to do whatever they want. I know. Was on proud display, <laughs> and in her power over everything was obvious and apparent mm-hmm. and. Uh, terrifying is what it largely came down to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. she was um, good. She was great. She yeah. was great. So ten out of ten for for Viola Davis there. Um, but yeah, so I mean, overall, I mean, I like I said from the very beginning, I feel like the as far as adaptation from from book to screen is concerned, I think that they they did a marvelous job. Yeah. I, I, I mean, this this is not like a like oh the book's better <clears throat> than the movie because the movie was bad. I think the book provides a lot more layers to the story that the movie simply couldn't provide. Right. Without, like without this being like a like a 12 episode like you know, we're like 12 hour long saga, like you're never going to be able yeah, to include no. everything. And I did, I mean, uh, just in like the little, you know, tiny conversation we've had outside of the movie theater last night with the people we saw it with, I, I it seemed like there was some muttering of like, I kept thinking it was over. Like, you know, like it seemed like you'd reached the end and like, oh wait, there's like, you know, I think um, because the traditional Hunger Games model is typically like you spend a bunch of time in the districts, then you go to the capital for a while, then you're in the games for a while, and then the book ends. Right. Yes. Basically immediately. Yeah. Who and wins? Yeah. Who wins? And that's sort of the end of it. And so they they sort of still have that, but it's just you start in the capital, then the games, then the districts. Right. Yeah. yeah. But it's easy to think like once the games are over, like, all right, Lucy Gray won. And, like, and then all of a sudden you're like, wait, now we're going to District 12? Hey, there's there's like a whole hour left of this? Are you yeah. kidding? So I can see where I'm might like feel long is but if you haven't like read the book or something if I, I knew that was coming so i was just like all right let's see it let's go to district 12. right yep you what, know what happens now how are they gonna do it now um uh, yeah no so I, I i agree i could see a lot of people thinking like oh i thought it was over oh and then it kept going yeah um sometimes i think i can grow on you i think when we first watched the movie moana i remember like talking about the original trip to take and i was like why don't we go and fight the villain twice yeah and then it's like once i've watched it like 800 times which is my daughter's favorite movie so um like i'm like oh yeah it really makes sense yeah, huge kinda, character growth you yeah. kind of need both visits um uh, but yeah so i think that that's that's one of those where i could see people having that critique as well where it's kind of like um you know, like it, it felt like, oh, the Hunger Games was over. This is a Hunger Games movie. So like Lucy Gray wins, hooray! Yay, and then, you we know, did it. Like Coriolan is gonna <clears throat> be powerful now. Um, but I think it adds, you know, some additional some additional depth. It, it allowed more opportunity for their relationship, you know, to to ultimately unfold. Which oh yeah. Is absolutely vital to the story. Um, and, and especially again, that piece of major connective tissue between, you know, this prequel to the rest of the series right. and how it all fits together. Yeah. Um, you got a score for it? I think I would probably give it like a like a solid 90. Okay, there yeah. we go. I yeah. mean, I was entertained the entire way through. I thought, yeah, it was a fantastic adaptation of book to book to screen. I thought the performances were really good. I thought like the the, the points they were trying to make about how much the Hunger Games suck and like the dangers of like this kind of government are all very present and obvious. Yeah, yeah. Um, I just, yeah, I like, I enjoyed it. I thought it was really entertaining and I would, you know, I, I would definitely go see it again. Yeah, um, yeah. No, I mean, I I think basically across the board, I, I, I feel like, you know, like being kind of reiterating the same sentiment over and over again. But I, I mean, I think it was just basically like, like I, I think it's a masterclass in, in taking the such a long narrative, figuring out which be- bits are going to be absolutely essential um, for viewers to be able to like maintain the um, the necessary story elements without like changing anything drastically, without yeah. like introducing like an odd new character that feels like out of left field, without being like, well, that just goes otherwise unexplained completely. So like, I think that like you know whoever the team was that was involved with converting this book to a uh, film script is something that lots of other um, yeah. like, you know, like book to film adapters can learn from and and be like, okay, what was the way in which they, they kept all the tent poles in the right spots to right. make sure that we're like covering all the necessary bits. <clears throat> Um, you know, and, and so like any critique I have of it isn't, isn't anything other than the, what I keep coming back to, which is I was like, I just think that the book as a medium is just a is just a better medium for such a delicate story that's mm-hmm. that's walking so many of these lines with so many different characters that yeah. like are arguably like one foot on both sides a little bit. Um, but I also really enjoyed the movie and I gave it an 86. Oh, nice, um, solid. So yeah, Very good. I, I think it was, um, I was definitely like, I was, 
I was very excited for this movie for most of the year because I, I feel like we went into like a huge Hunger Games kick yeah. over the summer. Um, I had a blast, you know, like the way that we were like researching right. and delving into the theories. I would also say if you only read The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes once, I would reread it. Yeah. Because I remember reading it the first time and being like, I was almost caught off guard by like, wait, Snow becomes like a private, like a peacekeeper for a while and he goes to the district. I remember thinking like that's sort of a random term, but like when I revisited the whole thing, I was like, no, that was all awesome. That was yeah. all, yeah, it all makes sense a, a lot more to me. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it, it and the other thing too, and, and this was, even in the movie, this was catching me off guard, even knowing all the characters themselves, but the names of all these capital citizens are so like. Oh yeah, Clemencia and Sejanus. Yeah, they're, they're all yeah. like, like they're not names where you can you can like just park them in your brain and be like oh of course I've I've known a James before like that right. that name makes sense you know um, so I think sometimes that can be like one of those things where you're like okay wait I can't remember which one was Clemencia and which one was you know like whoever and and like th that would that would that threw me off I think a little bit because I was just trying to keep track of like who is who and where and how and and all the rest but yeah I think I totally agree with you I think it's definitely worth a worth a reread and. Uh, delving into all the rest. But as ever, be sure to let us know all of your thoughts in the towel section down below if you'd like to check out all of our theories. We made a super cut of all four um, Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes meets Hunger Games theories, all of which, uh, upon seeing the movie, I don't think anything has changed in the way yep. that I feel about all of them. Uh, we do dive deep into the books and we don't have any of the movie assets, obviously, as of the time that we recorded those because it simply wasn't out yet. But um, if you want to check that out, that entire video is just right over there. Otherwise, until next time, Bye.